You can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to be uh, in our third to final week uh, wrapping up Hebrews chapter 12 in this moment where we've been reminding ourselves again and again uh, what the pastor of Hebrews has been telling his audience, draw near, don't drift from Jesus Draw near near to him because Jesus is better. And it's the thing that he has been weaving together beautifully. I don't know if if, if you've been deep in Hebrews like I have, but it is a beautiful tapestry that's kind of weaving things together in and out. There's themes that he's talked about in Hebrews chapter three and four that we're gonna see play out in Hebrews chapter 12 today. And he's moved back and forth from exposition to encouragement, from from warning to to challenging and, and promises to all these little kind of things that he's just weaving in and out in a beautiful way. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And this morning, we're into kind of the fifth and final warning of the book. If you were with us uh, when we started this way back in September of last year, we started with, uh, in Hebrews chapter two, uh, noting that there are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. The first one starts with drifting. And we spent a lot of time talking about how drifting, you can move faster and farther away from God than you realize And that the progressions of warnings in Hebrews get more and more severe. That before long you begin to disbelieve or doubt that the gospel is good news. And then you begin to grow dull to it. And then by the passage that we are in today, we begin to defy it. We begin to squander the gospel that is right before us. And so that's the passage that we're going to read this morning. It's a bit of of a heavy passage but we're gonna read it. And then the other thing that I want you to know just kind of on the front end is uh, this was again written to a Hebrew audience. It's why it's called the, the letter to Hebrews. And so there was a lot in there from the Old Testament that the author of Hebrews is relying on their knowledge to draw truth out of. And so as we read our passage today, if there's something in here that you don't quite understand yet, that's okay. We're gonna unpack some of the Old Testament illustrations that the pastor uses, but let's first read the text this morning. Beginning in verse 15, all the way through the end of chapter 12. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when Esau desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and a darkness and a gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is things that have been made in order uh, that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, which with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. It's a heavy passage that's in front of us this morning, and we're going to get back into that. But let me kind of lighten the, the, the mood just for a second. They, uh, uh, at City Bridge, if, if you're not familiar uh, about this, uh, we don't teach this to you and discover, but we are uh, known to uh, play Farkle here. It's a dice game. Anyone kind of been in one of a City Bridge kind of Farkle game? There are maybe not as many this hour as there have been last hour, but uh, this is a game you can buy at the store. But we don't play to find a winner. We play solely to determine a loser. And that loser 
must endure a consequence of some kind. It's all in good fun, but uh, that's where kind of uh, we, we kind of build some culture in it. Now, if I'm ever in a staff Farkle game where for whatever reason I'm safe from the consequence, Kyle Kegler, our lead pastor, always pulls me aside and kind of whispers in my ear and he says, hey, hey, go rile up the room, work your magic, you know, kind of get into, kind of get into the players' heads and try to get them to do things that maybe they shouldn't do. And so I'm like, okay, mission, let's go. So let me, uh, let me kind of rile up the room. Can I tell you the best moment I've ever had at kind of working my magic, so to speak? It was, um, if, if y'all know Andre Sampson, right, our awesome elementary director, uh, yes, it was his first staff prayer, so he didn't know what he was walking into. And he was down, uh, he was in last place, and last place was gonna have to spend the night on the roof of this building in a tent. And he was kind of working his way back, uh, and he had gotten into a tie, and the room was in a frenzy, but he had one die left, and everyone was like, whoa, 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 just hold, st- and, 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 and we'll go into a, a tiebreaker. And statistically speaking, that was the right decision to make. But if you're trying to, work up a little drama like I was, you suggest something else. And so I hushed the room, I jumped up on a chair and I said, Andre, you look me in the eyes right now. And he's like, whoa, whoa, wait, what, what is it? And I said, hey, Andre, a thousand years from now, you're gonna wish you rolled that last die. <laughs> Andre looked at me and said, you know what, you're right. He stepped up, rolled that die, and he spent a night on top of the roof at City Bridge. <laughs> It's a ridiculous story, I know. I apologize for it. But I'll tell you, that, that whole idea of a thousand years from now, it's kind of stuck with our, it's, it's almost become like lore. We use it all the time now in kind of funny situations. And then we also start to kind of rope it into the reality of which we live today. It's, it's funny that, that you know, the, the, the line a thousand years from now has been something that the Lord's kind of ministered to me in my own heart at different times. When I find myself kind of getting um, kind of drawn off sides by something that just doesn't matter that much, and, and yet I'm getting worked up and my, my heart rate is kind of beating and my, my blood pressure begins to rise, I feel that Lord, the Lord just kind of whispered, hey, a thousand years from now, this isn't going to matter one bit. Lay it down. Set it down. And I do in some of those moments. There's other times where my heart gets wrapped around the things of this world, and my heart just wants to run all into it. And there's that, that moment where the spirit of God's just like, hey, that is but dust. Lay it down. A thousand years from now, it will be worth nothing. And so walk, wake up to the life that you have to live now. Look, all the world tells us is kind of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. Just kind of whatever, live whatever you can eat, touch, feel, experience today. It's all that there is. And yet the Christian knows that there is another life still to come. The Christian knows that there is another life in which we are to be mindful of, that, that, that a thousand years from now, it should kind of cause us to go, whoa, whoa, wait. How should I live today in light of what is to come? And if you haven't noticed, our Hebrews pastor has been in an absolute crescendo the last couple of chapters, trying to get our eyes off of our current circumstances and onto the life that is to come. At the end of Hebrews chapter 10, by way of warning, he said, whoa, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And so be ready for that moment. Get yourself ready. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, not by way of warning, but by way of inspiration, he puts forth some of the heroes of the saints, men and women that were able to get their eyes off their current circumstances and realize this is not the only world. They were able to get their eyes up and go, wait, there's another homeland that awaits me. And so if that is true, then it must change then how I live today. So the pastor's been spurring them on and today, He's going to kind of throw the, kind of the kitchen sink at us a little bit. He's going to give us some promises and some blessings to keep, be mindful of, but he is going to lean in and warn us. He is not necessarily hoping that it will go well for us today, but he does want our eternity to be great, and so he was going to lean in and push on us. Now, we, the, the believer knows that there is another life still to live, but... These are the only days right now by which we get to walk by faith. One day, our faith will be sight. And we'll put our faith aside. But these are the days. This is kind of our dice roll, so to speak, in order to walk faithfully 
with the time that the Lord has given us. And so the pastor, I believe, is going to give us three final warnings to kind of increase our strength to be found faithful today. So that's going to be our movements of our passage, that the pastor is going to say, don't forsake your spiritual responsibility. Don't squander it. Be faithful today. These are the only days that some of these spiritual responsibilities will be before us. Don't forget your spiritual blessings and don't refuse him who speaks to you today. Let's jump into the first warning. Don't forsake your spiritual responsibility. Let's pick it up back in verse 15. The Hebrews pastor writing to his audience, see to it. See to it. By the way, that is a plural command. See to it. That is not an individual command. That is, hey, us, see to it. One another, show mutual concern for one another. See to it, all of us, that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. That is a mutual job, church. This is part of the spiritual responsibility of believers is to kind of look to one another, to help one another in perseverance. And this is a theme that the pastor has been weaving all throughout the letter of Hebrews. Way back in Hebrews 3.13, what did he say? Exhort one another while it's still called today, lest your heart be deceived by sin. He was saying, everyone, look to one another. Believers, you've got to care mutually for one another. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, stir one another up to love and good deeds. Don't forsake gathering together. This is the pastor going, there is a mutual concern. There is a spiritual responsibility for those of us that have been rescued by Christ. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was, the message was like, hey, get saved and then kind of chill until heaven comes, right? And, 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 and it just bypasses the call on my life, the high call of following Jesus. The pastors would vehemently speak out against that type of messaging. No, when you have been rescued by Jesus, you have been called on mission. You now have a spiritual responsibility to begin to make sure no one falls short of the grace of God. And so we have two kind of things that the pastor's kind of encouraging us in this section that he's telling us we've got a pastor and we have to protect one another. We have to pastor, make sure no one uh, fails to obtain the grace of God, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy. And then we also have to protect and make sure that no bitter roots of bitterness spring up. So the first thing that we have to do is, is pastor. When those of us are caught in sin, we, the church, are supposed to move towards them and restore them in a spirit of gentleness. That's what pastors do. They shepherd, they meet a person right where they are in point A. They don't just leave them there, but they shepherd them along to point B and to point C and to point D. They don't leave them, they meet them where they're at, and then they move them closer in their faith journey. Move them along in their faith journey. I don't know about you. Also, that have you ever met, a, met someone that claims to be a believer, but you look at their life and you're like, I don't see it. I just don't see it. Years I've walked with this person and I don't see any transformation. And it's really easy to be like, what's wrong with that person? Pastor in the room. You are called to move towards that person. Make sure they're not falling short of the grace of God and poke and prod and push and lean in and ask questions. Don't wait for someone else to do. Assume that you are the only person in their life that is bold and courageous enough to move towards them. Go pastor those that are stuck in their ways It's what we're called to do. It's our spiritual responsibility that the gospel has afforded us. It is a, we've been invited into an incredible mission. And the other thing that we're called to do is we are called to protect. We gotta be careful. And the phrase in in verse 15 is that no root of bitterness, that's in quotations in my Bible. And that's because it's coming from a passage in Deuteronomy 29. And this is not talking about different roots of bitterness that can show up in each one of our hearts. That That is definitely a possibility, but that's not what this passage is talking about. This is talking about, someone that becomes an entire root of bitterness that can defile the entire flock. And as a church, we've got to be on guard and to protect. We've got to be careful about the doctrine that's coming in because false doctrine can can ruin an entire church. And one root of bitterness has been known to cause much pain. As we've talked about the wilderness generation in our time in Hebrews, there were 601,000 adult Israelites that departed Egypt. And because of 10 spies, 
only two of them made it into the promised land. Ten roots of bitterness ruined an entire generation. And so church, it's our job to look to the flock and protect. Now that doesn't mean we just run around and go, you're a root of bitterness and you're a root of bitterness and you're out of here. You know, but we've got to be on guard and we've got to move towards them. We've got to have care. We have to have discernment and we've got to mutually be vigilant to protect that which the Lord has entrusted us with. And it's one of the reasons why I hope you're praying for our elders. That is the, one of their high calls is to kind of protect the flock. It's also our job, church, to come alongside and help them during that. Pastor uses Esau as an example. And so I wanna use that as an example. He says, make sure that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. He's kind of using Esau as an example of someone that was sexually immoral. He, Esau married kind of multiple pagan wives. The word for unholy is profane. Esau would kind of present himself. Uh, th that word would be someone that would walk into the temple without a care for the things of God, but just would show up in the temple and say, don't be like Esau. But then notice what it says about Esau. This is someone who forsook his spiritual responsibility. Look what it says. He sold his birthright for a single meal. We know that, that, that Esau, this is return, uh, referring to the time that uh, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. And we're like, well, that, that's not a smart situation. I mean, I don't care how hungry you are. Don't do that. But it then says, for, for you know that afterwards, obviously talking to an audience that is well acquainted with the story of Esau, he says, then when Esau desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Now, if you write in your Bible, I want you to circle the word blessing and circle the word birthright. Those are not synonyms. Those are not synonyms. Let me define them for you. The birthright was, uh, was, pri was the privilege of being the firstborn that comes with spiritual responsibility. That was the birthright. That was kind of the role in which Esau was, was born into. The blessing was this idea, uh, especially in kind of ancient Hebrew culture, that was about physical or financial or agricultural blessing that would accompany the birthright. Scripture tells us in Genesis 25, 34, that Esau despised his birthright hated it. He's like, what? If that can get me out of this hunger for a second, off you go, birthright. But he still wanted the blessing. That's Genesis chapter 27. He wanted, he despised the spiritual responsibility of his birthright. He just wanted physical blessing. He wanted prosperity, but not the spirituality that he was being called to undertake. To say it another way, he wanted this world, but not heaven. He wanted the things of God, but not God himself. He squandered his spiritual responsibility. And in a way, church, it may not be a bowl of stew, but in the light of, say, a thousand years from now, don't we do the same thing in many ways? We squander what the Lord calls us to, and we chase after the things of this world that at the end of the day, it's just lentil stew, <laughs> that one day someone will look at, well, like that was a bad exchange. And we do this, whether it's in our marriage, right? We, we all want the blessing that might come with a, with a God honoring marriage. We all want the blessing, but few of us want the responsibility of cultivating what it would take to allow for the blessing to occur. We want kids or we want to be one that would reflect well upon others, but we don't want the God given responsibility of allowing ourselves to be disciplined, to be discipled. Maybe this one connects. We want the blessings of a healthy church without the God-given individual and spiritual responsibility that comes with it. If you're a believer in the room, you are called to be connected to a local body of believers. You are called to be committed to them. And you are called to contribute your time, your talent, and your treasures. That is your spiritual responsibility of someone that has been saved. And if you are squandering that today, if you are living in any other way, you are squandering your spiritual responsibility. And all that you're really wanting, I think, is some of the blessings that come along with it, but you're forsaking the birthright. You're selling it for something else. And the pastor is saying, don't do it. Because before long, there will come a moment where the, your, the, the, the foundation of your life will begin to crack, whether it's, whether it's uh, in some of your relationship with friends, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in other parts of your family, or even within your church, your community group, the foundation will begin to crack. It did for Esau. 
And it says that when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. That feels like a scary verse, feels like a scary phrase. What does that mean? That he found no chance to repent. Second Corinthians seven ten says there's two types of tears and it really matters which one. There's tears that are of the godly kind, a godly sorrow. And those type of tears lead to repentance without regret that kind of guide us towards salvation. But there's another type of tears. It's the tears that I think that that Esau had. They're tears that are of worldly sorrow and it just spirals us towards death. To use last week's language, Esau just hated his consequence. He didn't hate the sin that led to the consequence. Esau was likely but a hard-hearted sinner who hated the consequences of not getting his blessing but he cared not of his offense towards God when he rejected his spiritual responsibility as the birthright. It's a big difference. And he also found no chance to repent because once you sell it, in this instance, you don't get another shot. Pastor's gonna say, don't be Esau. He's gonna tee it back up for us here in this next passage. But let's move on to kind of warning number two, which is don't forget your spiritual blessings we're going to be in verses 18 through 24 here. And this is kind of a, a passage that just, I got to give a little bit of context on the front end. He's going to compare two mountains. He's going to compare Mount Sinai with Mount Zion. And Mount Sinai is, is when the, 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 what he's going to kind of talk about in these first three verses is when the nation of Israel came to Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. And he's going to talk about that moment for them. And then he's going to say, don't go back to that moment. I want you to go, you are a people of another mountain. You're a people of Mount Zion. So let's look at it. Verse 18, for you have not come to what may be touched. Again, referring to Mount Sinai, think Exodus 19 and 20. If you wanna go read it for yourself, you haven't come to a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. This was what was surrounding Mount Sinai when the 10 commandments were giving. You haven't come to the sound of a trumpet and a voice. This is God. You haven't come to God's voice whose words literally made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them for they cannot endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that their own mediator, Moses, also said, I tremble with fear. These Hebrew believers, most of them had been rescued by Jesus. They were invited to a completely different mountain with tons more blessings. And yet they were kind of looking over their shoulder going, let's just go back to the law. And it's like the equivalent. And and sometimes it's like spiritual amnesia or we have amnesia. You know how sometimes like kind of as as time passes by, you, you have like nostalgia for something that once was. It would be like the Spotify user going, man, cassette tapes were the awesome. I want to go back to cassette tapes. It's like, you have, you have amnesia about the pain that cassette tapes were. And they don't go back to the law. In fact, the people that, when the law was given, they were like terrified of God's voice. God orally spoke the 10 commandments and the people of God were like, no more, please only speak to this guy over here. And even that guy, the mediator was like, ooh, it's a heavy word. It's a heavy job. They were so afraid that they built a fence around Mount Sinai so they couldn't draw near. That's what the pastor's been telling them for 12 chapters, draw near to God. The people at Mount Sinai drew a fence so they would pull away from God. All that the law could do was reveal their sin. It couldn't save them because when man's holiness meets God's holiness, it's a fearful thing. And so the pastor looks at them and says, this isn't the mountain you've been called to. You've been invited to a completely different mountain. Verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion. Listen to some of these spiritual blessings. And you have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. The, the Mount Sinai was marked by, was characterized by fear. This mount is characterized by joy and feasting. He's saying, no, come to this mountain. Experience all the fullness of the benefits. Don't forget the blessings that Jesus has purchased for you. And one day, I, I don't know where you live today, I don't know where your life will end up, but a thousand years from now, you will one day, believer, live in a place called New Jerusalem. You can count on it and take it to the bank. And you are gonna come to the assembly of, there's the word, firstborn, or you're gonna come to the church of the firstborn. Those of you that did not forsake your spiritual responsibility, you're gonna one day gather. 
in the new Jerusalem and we're gonna celebrate stories of faithfulness all day long and how the Lord used the church. A flawed institution to proclaim God's perfect message and we're gonna get to hear and we're gonna gather, we're gonna be together and we're gonna come to God himself, the judge of all, we're gonna be able to come near to him because we have been dressed in the robe of Christ's righteousness and we'll be able to draw near to him. We don't have to build a fence around him and we're gonna come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and we're gonna come to Jesus face to face, the mediator of a new covenant and we're gonna to come to his sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is all that is awaiting for us. Love that last phrase. We're gonna to come to his sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What does that mean? It's likely a reference to Genesis 4.10. If you're not familiar with it, Abel was murdered by his brother Cain. And when God showed up to, to to meet Cain, God says to Cain, why is your brother's blood, why is Abel's blood crying out to me from the ground? And it begs the question, what was Abel's blood crying out for? It was crying out for justice. It's crying out for God to do something about sin in this land. It was crying out for vindication of God's holy ones. It was crying out for peace and restoration. This was Abel's blood. Christ's blood speaks a better word. What does Christ's blood speak? All the things that Abel's blood longed for, Christ's blood supplies. Abel wanted justice, God gave it through Jesus' blood. Abel's blood wanted vindication of the holy ones, Jesus' blood now vindicates and makes us holy. Abel's blood wanted a response to sin, and Jesus' blood is God's response to sin. Abel was but a sinner crying out for help. Jesus was God, a very God. Come as man to die for us on the cross. His blood shed on the cross speaks the much better word. Don't forget your spiritual blessings. If you're in the room today, heed this, please listen. All of us in this room, we've all kind of had that moment of kind of being a little bit like Abel's blood where our bodies groan under the weight of our own sin and shame, our own toil and struggle against that which just we keeps eating our lunch at times and we hang our head and we just are kind of like, Lord, who can deliver me from this body of death? Answer, the blood of Christ shed for us on a cross. If you have not yet trusted in the blood of Christ, please listen, please listen. You are battling sin and you are battling shame. And Christ's word has already spoken defeat over those things. But you must accept the free gift. You can't just squander the gospel like Esau did and go, hey, I saw it, I noticed it, but you didn't do anything with it. Or better yet, you turned your back on it. You must respond to this free gift. The wages of sin, scripture tells us, is death. That's true for every last one of us in here. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Yet praise be to God that the free gift of God is found in Christ Jesus our Lord who came in the form of man, died the death that we deserved while living a perfect life. He was an unblemished lamb. He was a qualified lamb that was worthy to shed his blood on our behalf. And he atoned for your sin on the cross. If you have not yet trusted in what Christ did for you on the cross, I am begging you, please make today the day to respond. Don't squander the gift. Don't squander the gospel. You are also letting aside, you are also setting down endless spiritual benefits. Don't make that mistake today. Jesus' blood is the better word. You literally, today, you can exchange your sin and shame and in its place, received Christ's righteousness and the promise of heaven. It's a free gift. Scripture says, verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the gospel that's being presented. Don't refuse it. If you reject 
Christ's blood, there, is, there exists no escape from God's judgment. And it is a fearful thing when the unholiness of man meets the holiness of God. There is no escape if you do not trust in Christ's shed blood for you. And a thousand years from now, you won't have an opportunity to come back. And you will spend eternity separated from God. Don't refuse him who speaks today. Please come down front at the end of this message. Come down front. We'll have people that would love to just share with you. Don't refuse him who speaks. That's the, that's the message. If you're a non-believer in the room, it's okay. We've all been there. Don't squander it right now. Because scripture tells us that if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, this is talking about the wilderness generation, the people that were around Mount Sinai, they didn't, re- they didn't escape judgment when they refused him. How much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven? Christ hadn't yet died on the cross when the Israelites showed up at Mount Sinai. Fast forward about 3,500 years later, we sit in a room where we know Christ died on a cross to shed his blood for us. We have greater awareness of all that God has done on our behalf. There is a greater spiritual work. We've been invited to a completely different mountain. And so, of course, there will be a great judgment that awaits for us, just like there was then. So you can't escape it. At that time, his voice shook the earth. The earth literally quaked at the giving of the Ten Commandments. But now he has promised yet once more, and I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. He's now referring to judgment at this point, quoting the prophet Haggai, that one day it's all going to shake again. And this is what's going to happen. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. If you have built your your house on any other thing than the foundation of Christ, it will be shaken free. And you will be considered that which is old and be discarded. All that will remain... When judgment comes and the heavens shake and the earth shakes is that which that has been made new. And it's why we speak Revelations 21 so much is that one day there is coming a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And guess who its inhabitants will be? Those that have trusted in the blood of Christ. Why? Because they are now new creations. And so even though the heavens and everything shakes, those that are new will stand firm on the rock that is Christ. Now the beautiful thing, we do have some old bodies and we'll get rid of those. And all those old sin struggles, all those old tears, all those old mournings, all those old pains that people have done to you and you've done to other people, all of it will fade away and will be given a new body that day. The pastor's saying, be ready for it. Be ready for it. The day is coming, my friends. And so how are we supposed to live kind of between two earthquakes, so to speak? How are we supposed to live? The pastor tells us right here in verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Live in gratitude. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship. That's acceptable service. It sounds like Romans 12, doesn't it? Sounds like put your life on the altar and become a living sacrifice. That's the right response to the blessings that await us. And we do so with reverence and awe. One day your face is gonna be sight if you've trusted in Christ. And think about it, a thousand years from now, with that lens, how will you have wanted to live today in a manner worthy of what the Lord is preparing for you and me? It makes me wanna get after it makes me not want to squander the things that he's given. It makes me want to kind of put my life up on the altar and do something different. And so with that in mind, what would you do? What would your kind of acceptable worship, to use the pastor's language here, acceptable service look like? Would you relentlessly push for reconciliation in a way that you haven't yet? If you knew that a thousand years from now, would you push for reconciliation? Would you share? Would you tell more people about Jesus? Would you do the job of pastoring and protecting so that others might not fall short of the grace of God? Would you do that work? Would you handle your money differently? If you realized it would be worth nothing one day, would you steward it differently today for the glory of God? Would you keep flirting with sin as you still do today? Or would you do everything in your power to kill it? Right here, right now. 
Would you be bold and courageous to speak up in a decaying world? And I'm not talking with anger or frustration. I'm talking with a desperate compassion for the lost. Desperate to see no one fall short of this grace. No one to come to what the pastor is going to say is a consuming fire. It's where the passage ends. For our God is a consuming fire. The pastor is very clear. The day is coming when the earth will shake again and so too will the heavens. Judgment is coming and we are gonna be face to face with our God who is a judge and he is a consuming fire. And I'm telling you, it's a fearful thing. Non-believer in the room, one last time, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. When our unholiness meets God's holiness, it is a fearful thing. And that consuming fire, it will not go well for you that day. And so please do not refuse him who is speaking. Do not refuse the blood of Christ, which speaks louder and better than Abel's blood. Don't refuse it today. Those of us that have been washed clean by the blood, that day's gonna look a lot different, amen? Our God is a consuming fire, yes. But in that day for us, he'll be like a refining fire. And all the old stuff, all the struggles, all the lies are going to melt away. And I want to be ready for that day. And I want to live in light of the day that is to come. And so I appreciate gracious warnings that frankly I probably didn't do enough warning of. But it helps spur me on to live completely different today. That's what our pastor has been crescendoing to. Hold strong, endure, persevere because there is a day coming and I want you to be found ready.